Hey everyone, how's it going? Welcome to part 10 of this Final Fantasy 3 Pixel Remaster Platinum Trophy walkthrough. We are picking up right where we left off last time. We have just gotten the Bahamut Summon and all of the summons. Got the Summon Master Trophy as a result. And now we're flying out of the floating continent and we're going to go to the once flooded world. And we're going to make our way all the way up to the Nautilus airship. You can find it very easily by looking at your mini-map and you can see the little blue dot that's on it. You just want to fly to Saronia and then follow the river to the west of it. And eventually you'll get back to this same swampy area that we've been to before. We will hop off of the Invincible airship and into the Nautilus. And what we're going to do from here is we're going to fly it toward the south and we're going to go all the way back to Doga's Manor. So go to the very bottom continent and then you have to approach it from the south. You will go through the narrow passageway and just work your way toward the north. Find a good landing spot up there and then proceed inside of Doga's Manor. From there, just take a couple steps down and you'll get a cutscene. Welcome back, warriors. Une and I have been busy preparing for your arrival. Doga's voice echoed down the hall. Make your way through the tunnel. We await you at the end. We've been transported to Doga's Grotto. This is a one-time visit location, so we're going to get all of the B-Seri entries and all of the treasures in this one run. We're going to start by going down and a little bit toward the west and south. We're going to work our way down to the very bottom of this area. We did encounter these enemies. These are Cyclops. We're pretty powerful for this point right now, so we're able to do some really good damage against them, and they die in just a couple of hits. They can hurt us too, so just be careful about that. When you make it to the bottom, you'll go into this room and you can walk around to grab one treasure chest with 20,000 gil and then we'll keep working our way around to the left. Here are some nemesis enemies. Again, we're just going to hit them with some good physical attacks and I'm going to throw a little bit of extra damage their way by having my white mage cast Aeroga and we're getting Thundaga from Ingus, the Magus. All right, with those enemies eliminated, we're going to keep working our way around and you can go all the way to the right. You'll pass the stairs and grab the chest all the way on the right side for another 20,000 gil and now go down those stairs. From here, you're going to go around to the first intersection and then keep going north. If you go to the door on the left, it's a total dead end. So go up to the second intersection, then go left and into the door. From here, grab the three treasure chests inside and then go back out. We're getting lots of shining curtains. Now go to the right and you're going to head up slightly and then into the next door on the right. Proceed through here and grab the one treasure chest at the top. And now we're going to walk around in this room. We need two more enemies, the Humbaba and the Ogre. Once again, we're just going to attack them like we normally would through most fights. We can endure their hits pretty well, and this fight shouldn't take too long to get through. Once you've defeated all those monsters, then head down the stairs on the right side of that room. Now we're on the third level, just keep going south all the way to the end and then head to the right. Before you go in the door, we're just going to heal up with our white mage, cast a bunch of cures on people and we should be good to go from here. Don't forget to quick save because we've got two back to back bosses as soon as we go in here. So head on up and you will see two familiar faces. You made it. We are about to complete the Eureka Key, but first you must defeat both Une and me in battle. That's right. Think you can handle us? What? Why do we have to fight you? Listen well. 
Long ago, mankind came into possession of weapons far too powerful for them to wield. They were sealed away in Eureka, but now they are necessary. In order to go to Eureka, you need the key. But to create this key, we need massive amounts of energy, energy we can only produce in battle. No, Doga, Une, there has to be another way. We can't fight you, you're our friends. Innocent fools, if you will not attack me, then I will take the initiative. Prepare yourselves. Doga attacked. I bet you didn't expect a Doga to look like this, did you? Well, we really have a nice advantage in this because we picked up a lot of shining curtains and what that does is it puts the reflect status on us. You want to think of these two boss fights, Doga and Une, as a black mage and a white mage fighting you. So Doga represents the black mage and he's going to attack us with lots of black magic. We're going to counter that by having the reflect status on our characters. So using those shining curtains, we can bounce his magic back onto him and he will take the damage instead. You should know that the reflect status doesn't last forever, so you might have to reapply it if you want to, but it will definitely get us through a large portion of this battle. So I used three shining curtains, two for the black belts and one for our magus and then we just had our white mage use the reflect spell and that allows us to put up reflect on all of our characters all at once and for the rest of this fight we're just going to go on full attack mode so have your black belts do their strongest attacks you can have your white mage cast aroga and our magus is going to be hitting him with a bunch of Fyraga spells with this strategy, we're going to do tons of damage to him every turn because we'll be hitting him with strong attacks, but also because he'll be bouncing powerful spells like Flare off of us, we're going to be having him hurt himself this entire time too. So really, it's five attacks towards him, and we're not taking any damage at all. This is a very easy fight with the proper setup, and it shouldn't take you very long at all to finally bring Doga down. If you like that strategy and want some more, don't forget to hit that subscribe button so you can join the Masked Matador community and stay up to date with all the great tips and tricks coming your way. Please don't die, Doga. Next you will face me. Are you ready? Une, don't. We don't want to fight you. Now's not the time for chit chat. Don't worry, even if our bodies perish, our spirits can't be destroyed. Now, fight me! As I said earlier, Doga represents the black mage and Une represents the white mage. And actually, white mages have some pretty nasty spells with them, so you need to be a little bit careful with this. We're going to do a modified version of our tactic with the Doga fight, and that is we just have one of those shining curtains left, so I'll just use one on a black belt, and then I'll just have my white mage cast another reflect on a different black belt and that way at least they're protected against that uh, they have a little bit worse magic resistance than our mages do so they'll take a little bit more damage and we'll just protect them from some extra spells that way Une is able to bypass some of that her aroga spell isn't affected by the uh, barriers or the reflect status that we set up and neither is her snowstorm ability but tornado luckily does bounce back it doesn't put her into critical damage, but it doesn't put us into critical damage either. So it's a nice little protection against a very bad situation. Other than that, we're just going to spend our turns having our black belts attack. We can then cast Aroga with our white mage and do strong spells like Fyraga or Quake with your Magus. And this battle should be over pretty quickly within just a couple minutes. If you're enjoying these videos, don't forget to hit that like button and leave a comment down below. It really helps me to know that I'm making the right kind of stuff and it helps the channel grow, which helps all of us. Doga, Une. Now the Eureka Key is complete. Take it with you.
received Eureka Key. Doga, no! Don't fret. My spirit will live on, no matter what state my body is in. It is up to you now. Go to Circa's Tower, beyond the statues. Zande is attempting to call forth darkness into this world. He must be stopped. You must get to Circus Tower to enter Eureka. Here, take this. It's the Circus Key. You need this to open the door to the tower. You are not alone. We will continue to watch over you. Please stop, Zandy. Une! Received Circus Key. Now remember that this is a one-time visit location, so we need to make sure that we have everything before we leave. If you go into the bestiary, we're going to go all the way down to number 156, and that's where you're going to find Ogre, and then Cyclops, Nemesis, and Humbaba. If you've got all those, then you're all set for this location. We also collected all six of the treasure chests, no hidden items. So we can either use an Otter Shroom or the White Mage Teleport spell to get out of here quickly. So now we're done with Doga's Manor, leave, and I wonder what we should do now. Hey, that's a great idea. Let's go get all of the Chocobo Wood locations. So we're going to hop aboard the airship and fly around. I'm going to keep track of all 13 of them in the upper left-hand corner, so use that as your guide. We will go into the floating continent, and now we're going to go just to the right of it, and we can walk into the first Chocobo Woods from there. For the second one, we're going to fly north and we're going to go up to the little crescent shaped island here. If you can find a good place to uh, park the airship in the green space, you can walk on over and into the Chocobo Woods. Head back out. And now we're going to go slightly south from there. We're going to hop aboard the airship and fly just a little bit south over the water. And you can park right at the top part of this little continent and you can walk into the Chokwa woods from there. Three down and 10 to go. We have all the three on the floating continent done. So that means that we have to head back to the flooded world. And that just means fly off the edge of the map and you'll go back to the other world. From here, we're going to fly east all the way toward the eastern continent, still in the southern region. But if you remember where the Temple of Water is, you have to follow the rivers up past the big lake. And then if you park in the green space at the top, behind the Temple of Water is where you can find the Chocobo Woods. So walk in there and now we can leave that area. Let's get back into the airship. We're going for Chocobo Woods number five now. We will fly south past the big lake, keep going south through the river, and then just a little bit further south, you're going to find the Chocobo Woods kind of in the bottom portion of this section here. So walk into the Chocobo Woods, and now we can leave this area. Number six is very close by. We just have to go a little bit south and then west around this mountain range. And it's located right between the desert and where Goldor Manor is. So walk into the empty spot in the forest and that's the Chocobo Woods. Now go ahead and get back into your airship and we're going to go find number seven. For this, we're going to head west and then way north. We're going all the way up to the section kind of between the two big chunks of the continent there. There's a lake right next to it. So walk inside and you can pick up that Chocobo Woods. Number eight is pretty close. Hop on your airship, head toward the west, and then go north once you pass the mountains. Stick along the western edge of this continent and you'll find it in this green space with sporadic trees out there. Okay, as for number nine, we will once again get in the airship, and this time we're going to fly toward the southwest. We're going to go down toward the southern tip of the Saronia area, and we can pick it up right at the bottom portion of these woods. 
For 10, we're going to once again go pretty close by. We'll fly north past Saronia and then go toward the left and you can find it hanging out over here. If you land nearby, you can just walk right inside and get that one. We're getting back into the airship for number 11 and what we want to do is fly toward the east and then south to go past Saronia. And now we're going to follow the river around and right before it goes between the mountains, there's a little break in the forest and that's a chocobo woods. So land anywhere nearby. There is a spot right next to it, but it's hard for me to maneuver to that one. So I'm just going to walk it instead. And we're just going to go to the open spot right next to the river. Okay, we're leaving and going on to number 12. So let's go back to our airship. And from here, what we want to do is to start flying a little bit toward the west again. We're going to go through this little mountain pass here, and the Chocobo Woods is just on the other side before you hit the ocean. Last but not least, we have number 13, the very last one that we have to get. So let's hop aboard our airship, and we actually have to go get the other airship, the Invincible. You can find it on your minimap as a little blue dot. If you follow the rivers around, eventually you'll get back to the marshy area, and then you can hop aboard. And we're going to fly it to the Falgabard area, and the quickest way to get to that is, once again, just to follow the rivers around. And you can either go toward the east or the west, it doesn't matter, but then go a little bit south, looping your way around until you see the little bit of mountain range that you can hop over, and then just work your way around to this Falgabard town, land anywhere that you want to in this open space, and then just walk into the Chokwa woods that's nearby. All right, and there you go. That's all 13 of the Chocobo Woods. So what we're going to do now is just a double check of everything because we're going to start marching toward the end of the game and the final dungeon. If you pull up your treasure tracker, you can see all the locations that we need to go to, and there should be 10 Chocobo Woods so far. There's a group of three at the top, and then two below that, three more further down, and finally one toward the bottom. And all in all, that makes 10 of them for the Flooded World section. Now we're going to go over toward the Floating Continent. So you have to, once again, hop aboard the Invincible Airship, jump over the mountains, and then get over the next mountain range. Then finally, we're going to fly over to the southwest part of the map, the bottom left-hand corner. There's that little floating island over there. If you go there, we're able to pull up that treasure tracker again and see other locations that are unique to this area. So pulling that up, you should then find the remaining three Chocobo Woods that can be found in this section of the map. So these three plus the other 10 equals 13, and that means that you have all of the Chocobo Woods, and you should be good to go with that. Now we're going to go through that same treasure tracker, and we're going to look and make sure that we have all of the treasures and all of the hidden items for each location. All of them should be totally full, so it should say 8 out of 8 or 3 out of 3. There should never be a 20 out of 21, let's say. You should have all of them for all locations. And if you have that, then you can feel very confident that you've gotten everything so far for this section. We're not really at a point of no return yet, and I have really been trying to point out when you're at one-time visit locations, there's not many of them. Well, once you have confirmed all of the treasures and items for the floating continent, we'll go back to the flooded world, and we're gonna do the same thing. We're gonna look to make sure that we have all of the treasures everywhere. The only exception should be the ancient ruins location. It'll be the very last one on this entire list. That's because it's our next location that we have to go to. We've been there once before where we had to fight Titan to get the earth crystal jobs and get the powers associated with that. So we just didn't fight anything there besides him. And now we're going to return to that place so that we can actually complete that dungeon and that will progress us toward the end of the game. So there you go, only zero out of 15 for that location. Now let's go there and complete it. Fly up to the northwestern continent and you can see a 
darker gray path that kind of snakes its way up through the lighter gray sections of the map and that's the route that you have to take so approach it from the south and then work your way through here you'll have to jump over the mountain range and eventually land up over toward the ancient's maze which is the wooden structure looking thing around the crystal tower let's head out of the airship and now we're going to do a double check for all of the bestiary entries so far. So if you open up your bestiary, we're going to scroll all the way down to number 163. I'm just going to page through this slowly so that you can double check your list compared to mine. Feel free to pause the video if you need to double check on anything. And you can usually revisit past areas if you need to. Um, so right around here, we have all of the monsters for this section around the Ancients Maze. So you should have all of those. Everything else on here is considered a boss. So we've gotten most of the bosses so far in the game. There are a good number still remaining. So we'll go and pick those up. Um, there's also a good deal of normal monsters throughout the remaining dungeons. We'll do a save out here, and then I'm going to look at some different jobs that are available to us. I decided that the black belt, while it's good, we don't really need it so much anymore, so I'm going to put on a knight and then a dragoon just for a little bit of extra damage for that. It doesn't really matter what job you're choosing, but I typically go with two melee jobs and then my white mage and then my, uh, my black mage or my magus there. Anyway, go into the Ancient's Maze, and instead of going through this door, we're going to walk around this whole center area. The Earth Crystal's in there, and it will still heal you and give you your MP back if you talk to it. But once you get past it, go all the way to the right to pick up an elixir, and now head all the way to the left. There's a door over here that you need to go through. So from here, you're going to go up and then keep going up. There's a couple treasure chests up in this area, so grab those two. And now we're going to go back down toward the entrance. Now we're getting into some of the more formidable monsters around here. We've got four Iron Claws, and they can do some pretty good damage to us. The main thing about the combat system in this game is that it's driven very strongly by job level. So if you're going into this place with a job with a low level, you're not going to do a whole lot of damage in battle. So I do have a knight here and he is really underperforming for me just because the level isn't very good. So what I'm going to do after this fight is actually switch it over to a thief. I've got a little bit of a better job level with him because we've done other dungeons with that before. And I really just like how quickly you can attack with the thief. It's a pretty good job to have. And, uh, but it doesn't really matter. You can do whatever jobs you want to. But there's a huge discrepancy between my knight damage and my dragoon damage. So there you go. That's my rationale for why I'm making this switch right here. And it just helps me a lot to do some more damage. But do whatever jobs you want to. It's your game. Have fun with it. Well, we're going to proceed down and around toward the left. We ran into a bone dragon, and once again, if you're using weapons that steal life, it'll actually have the reverse effect on you, so that you'll take damage and it will heal the bone dragon. However, we can use curative magic, like using the Kira spell, to do lots of damage to it because it's undead. So you can do something like that, or just cast normal magic, or use a weapon that doesn't steal life, and you'll do plenty of damage to it. So just uh, be careful about this one, it's not too difficult. Uh, but it is kind of a nuisance if you're relying mostly on those life-stealing types of weapons. Okay, let's keep heading through the path. We'll go north at the next intersection to grab one more treasure chest, then head back to the intersection and go left. Head down and to the right to grab another treasure chest, and then back to the left and up. Just keep going up until you get to the end of the hallway, then go to the right to grab a treasure chest. On the way back, I ran into a greater demon. These guys aren't terribly difficult, but they do have the ability to spawn in additional Iron Claw enemies. So if you haven't found the Iron Claws yet, you can actually get this guy to spawn them for you, but he'll go down pretty quickly. 
I got the management laborer trophy for getting one job up to level 99. So that's really good. I'm gonna switch that white mage over to a devout very soon. And now we're just walking through the very linear pathway. When you get to the section here, you go south all the way and then grab the chest on the left, then head back toward the right. We ran into a Thanatos enemy. It's the headless horse person. It looks like a headless horse woman. And the horse, I don't see a head on that one either. So um, it's not very difficult. You can just use your normal attacks against it and uh, some good magic. You've probably got a lot of it now if you've been playing with the Magus for a while. And it goes down pretty easily. Okay, back to the intersection, we're gonna head south, and if you look at the mini-map, there's a little circular area that's a good place to just orient yourself to know where you're going with that. And we get three treasure chests at the bottom here. I'm gonna go through, make sure that all of my weapons are optimized, and then head north. Head to the right to grab another treasure chest over here, then go back to the left, and finally up into the next section. Keep going to the right, and we're going to then work our way through this passageway. This is when I realized that I still had that white mage on instead of switching over to a devout. The devout is just an upgraded form of the white mage. We've had a Refia as a white mage the entire game. Now it's time to finally give her the upgrade that she deserves and get access to even more powerful spells. Okay, so we're going to go around, grabbing the chest with the phoenix down over here, and then the far upper right corner has another treasure chest that you can grab for a protect ring. From here, head south, and then to the right toward the edge of the map, and then work your way down and to the left. That will take us all the way out of this whole big labyrinth of a section. We ran into an Une's clone on the way, and this one is very easy to defeat nowhere near as tough as what the boss was not saying that the boss was particularly tough but just a couple normal attacks i'm going to use a jump with the dragoon to land on her do lots of damage and ingus will just use quake and that will pretty much be enough to take her out a very low hp monster and not much of a problem at all to deal with Let's keep going all the way to the left, and then we're going to go up and through the door. In this room, there are two treasure chests, one on the left and one on the right, so go ahead and pick those up. We get a Holy Lance on the left, and we got Hellish Claws on the right. I'm going to equip the Holy Lance onto our Dragoon, just for a little bit of extra damage. And I'm going to put the Wind Spear on, just because I don't want to deal with anything that can absorb the uh, health from us when we use a Blood Lance. In this room, I was able to find a King Behemoth. This is the last monster that we need, and it's a pretty tough monster. Make sure that you keep the HP of your characters high, because as it gets down toward low health, it's going to use a Meteor, which will do a ton of damage to all of your party members. And if you're caught with low HP, you are going to die from this thing. So we will keep our HP high, use our strongest attacks to try to take him down quickly. He's got a lot of HP to deal with, and it's just like a mini boss from here. I did not encounter the King Behemoth anywhere else in this whole place, even though I looked for a long time. So I'm pretty sure that it only appears around this area. That was my experience at least. I don't know if you would have a different experience from me, but again, I did try looking around for a long time. And I would recommend that if you're looking to find this monster, go into this last room with the two different treasure chests in it. And that would be the place that I would look to save a lot of time. So again, just keep up on the strategy of using your best attacks. Keep your health high, and this monster should go down without too much of an issue for you. The King Behemoth has 17,000 HP, which kind of puts him in the same ballpark as Odin or Leviathan, if you want to think about it that way. So really, this guy is much like a boss in terms of how long it's going to take you to defeat him. So uh, just throw whatever you can at him, and you'll have him dead, hopefully pretty quickly.
All right, finally he's gone, and we can move on with the rest of this place. We're almost done with it. But we have all 15 treasure chests now, and if we go into the bestiary, we can scroll all the way down to number 164. That's Iron Claws, Greater Demon, Une's Clone, Thanatos, Bone Dragon, and King Behemoth. So 163 through 169. If you have all of those, then you can leave the Ancient's Maze and head outside. The crystal tower before us represents the ending of the game. So there's a few things to do here. We have to do Eureka, the crystal tower itself, and then the world of darkness following that. So we're getting very close to the end of the game. It's only those three sections. So I would imagine two more parts to do the rest of this. So we're very near the end. And I hope that you're having as much fun as I am doing this. Feel free to hit that subscribe button so that you can stay up to date with the epic conclusion for this game. And I will see you very shortly in the next episode. Thank you so much for watching and I hope you have a great day.